It's funny, you mentioned the, uh, the unborn. I saw today an image of the Flight 93 Memorial. Flight 93 was the plane that went down in Pennsylvania before it reached the terrorist destination because of the, uh, the efforts made by those on board. And um, one of those on board was Lauren Grain Colas, uh, and she was with child at the time uh, of her death. And there on the Flight 93 Memorial, uh, it has her name inscribed and then in light uh, engraving without the darkened um, part that the, the names have, it says, and unborn child. And uh, her unborn child would be a sophomore in high school today, which is amazing to think about that it's been 15 years. It is an honor for me to be here, although I will say this, I cannot believe that the people of Wabash County entrust their lives to Jason. Um, <laughs> I had this punk in high school, my first year teaching, and um, when I saw him stand up here, I about walked out the door right then, but I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. Uh, it was, this is something, you did this right out of high school, right? You went into, I thought so, and it was one of those weird things to see a student of yours automatically transition from being a student into being your hero, and he's been that ever since. Uh, ever since he left high school, so it was good to see him again. I also am thankful that Mr. Pope let us know that some would be leaving because they're on duty, because I am highly attuned to whenever emergency personnel start running out the door, it's time for me to go too. So um, <laughs> it would have been a very short service this morning had I not been aware of that. Last little bit of, uh, of, of um, housekeeping stuff. Uh, if you have a cell phone, I assume that you're used to doing this, but you need to turn those things off because that's something else I'm highly attuned to as a teacher. I'll tell you my favorite moment ever teaching was about five years ago. I had a girl in my class uh, who went to my church. And so I set this up ahead of time with her. I had an old cell phone that I don't use anymore. And on the first day when you're going through rules and all of that, uh, I, I got a hold of her before class and I gave her my old cell phone that was just sitting in a drawer. And I said, all right, listen, when you come into class, I want you to act like you're texting on the phone, like you're not supposed to be doing. As I'm giving the rules, you just text on the phone and then I'll take it from there. And she said, okay, I'll do that. So she comes in and she's pretending like she's texting as I'm giving the rules. And I just slowly walk over to her in the middle of giving my rules. I just reached down, I grabbed that phone and I chucked it and it just exploded against the wall. It was the greatest moment. For like 10 seconds, those kids were freaked out. I'm telling you, um, the birth of my children was wonderful. This was better. This was as good as it gets. Um, so anyway, make sure those cell phones don't ring because I will call you out. It was, uh, it was just a few years ago that I was at Walmart, of all places, and uh, I just purchased my essential breakfast of champions, uh, which consists of a little Debbie fudge round. I don't know if you've had these and the necessary ocean spray crane apple. If you put those two things together, they've been on my training table since I was a kid. But anyway, um, I was walking out of the store and I glanced over and sitting on those benches that are there at the front of the store, uh, there was an, an older gentleman, uh, an older gentleman and he was obviously, he wasn't decrepit or anything, but he just wasn't big and burly like someone like myself. And I looked at him and as I passed him, he was one of those gentlemen that's wearing uh, one of those, and my clicker's not working, I don't know, we, we tested this beforehand and it never works uh, when it's time to go. Did you do that or did I do that? You did that. I was afraid of that. All right. So it means the clicker's not going to work. Clearly, I told you this. Was, your youth minister, he has no idea what's happening up there. I just want you to know that, okay? Oh, everything will be fine, he said. Oh, it'll be great. Yeah. Uh, I'll try to cue you when it's time for those things. But anyway, I passed this older gentleman and he, he was wearing one of those hats uh, that, that uh, veterans wear, and you'll see them where it has like the name of their ship or whatever on it or where they served and what battle they served. And as I, as I walked by them, um, he smiled and I smiled and I just walked on. And I got out to my car and I was loading the groceries into the car. Uh, as usual, I was in a big hurry. Life is always so busy. Um, but as I was starting to load those groceries, I started thinking to myself, how tough would it have been for me to simply say something to that guy that was right there as I was leaving the store. So I did something that I never do. I, I set aside my busy schedule and I shut the car door and I locked it and I walked back in and I walked up to the guy who was still sitting there and I said, excuse me. And he looked up, he had a little bit of a puzzled face and, and I said to him, I noticed your hat um, and I'm sorry I didn't say anything. And he kind of frowned or, or scowled or looked like, what in the world are you talking about? And I just said, I wanted to come back and I wanted to say thank you. I want to say thank you for serving. I got to tell you, I wish you could have seen that man's face. 
I wish more than anything you could have seen that man's face. Because for just a brief moment in time, he was that 19 or 20 year old young man standing on the deck of his ship defending his country. Um, His chest puffed out and his little frail shoulders kind of went back. And he looked up at me and he spoke words to me that I will never forget. He said to me, son, I lost some very good friends over there. But I do it again. Because it was an honor. An honor to serve. I got to tell you that word, honor. um, It's a word we really don't get anymore. We use the term, and it's like the word awesome. We use the word awesome for things that aren't really awesome. Uh, But we use the word honor for things that aren't we. If we get good grades at school, we say that we're on an honor roll. Uh, We're to be honored because we got good grades. Um, If you win the 2016 Miss Tipton County Pork Festival pageant, we say that that is an honor, which being known as Miss Pork 2016 (laughs) doesn't seem like it would be an honor, but for some, it's an honor. I I stood a few years ago at Arlington National Cemetery. It's the resting place for so many brave Americans. Some of you have probably been there. And as I gazed on the rolling hillsides of the countless stone monuments, I felt a profound sense of gratitude. It was one of those moments that um, reality doesn't really sink in, but you find yourself just repeating the words, thank you, thank you, thank you, over and over to these soulless gravestones in a world that really has no clue, no clue what courage and honor and sacrifice really mean. I wanted to say thank you to every one of them for showing us what those words mean. It's one of those moments that I'll I'll be honest, I was thankful that I was an educator. Because at least as an educator, there is an element, there's a small avenue for me to be able to say a form of thanks. To be able to vow that for as long as I stand in a classroom, and I don't know where you are, but you can vow the same thing. That those that surround you, and for me, for those young people that I get every year, a different group of them... They will never fail to know what honor and courage and valor are. Why? Because I will tell them. I will tell them of the fateful exchange of rifle fire at at Lexington Green. And I can tell them of the courageous stand at that small chapel fort known as the Alamo. And I'll be able to tell them of how honor met honor on the bloody fields of Chancellorsville and Sharpsburg and Fredericksburg. I can tell them of the charge up San Juan Hill... I can tell them about the Battle of the Marne. I can tell them about the storming of beaches and the liberation of islands in the South Pacific. I can tell them about the bitter winters of Korea and the rice paddies of Vietnam. I can tell them about the sands of Desert Storm, the caves of Kabul and the sacrifices at Fallujah. Men and women who have given everything in service to this country. I vow to you that the children that I am able to impact will never fail to know what honor and courage are because I will tell them your stories. Sometimes when people hear me list off these sites of bloody conflict, they find it odd. And they think that there's some kind of a... Uh, and even the fact that you're doing this this morning, they think that there's something um, uh, confrontational, something that doesn't match, something that doesn't meet when a Christian chooses to talk about those who wage war, either uh, overseas or in our very streets. They think there's something not compatible about that, about war and and the message of Jesus Christ. After all, Christ's kingdom is predicated around peace. War is an ugly thing. But let me remind you what we need to be reminded of. Yes, war is an ugly thing, but it is not the ugliest of things. The decayed and the degraded state of moral and patriotic feeling that thinks that nothing is worth war is much worse. A man who has nothing for which he is willing to fight... Nothing that he cares about more than his own personal safety. That man is a miserable creature who has no chance of being free unless he is made and kept free by the actions of better men than himself. Listen, friends, no, there is nothing glorious about war and there is nothing honorable about war, but there is something glorious and there is something honorable about the recognition that there are things in this world that are worth fighting for and that are worth dying for and freedom from the hand of tyranny and oppression and injustice and, yes, terror, they are such things. You know, ours is a country that loses its focus. It reverses its priorities. 
Today's the kickoff of the, well, I guess Thursday was, of the NFL season. Pope reminded me of that with his tie that's got every NFL team on it. The man is obsessed. He said, if you are not done by the time of kickoff, there's going to be a, a riot and he's going to lead it. Um, <laughs> just kidding. He didn't really say that, but um, he didn't have to. I could see it on his face. Um, <laughs> No, but we, we, we have these things that we look at and, and the heroes that we make. And then there are things like the Colin Kaepernick situation that make us realize these are our heroes. No, friends, if you need to be reminded, let me tell you, our heroes are not those that put on baseball or basketball or football uniforms. Our heroes are those that proudly wear the uniform of their country, of their state, or of their county and city. Those are our heroes. <laughs> friends... You ask to see courage, and I say, look at these up here. Look at the city firefighters and the police. I think they're up here. You may have to click it again. They're not up there. I did see. I did see. I don't know what trick you were playing. Uh, the biggest thing is maybe if you can skip ahead to the slide that's coming up in just a little bit. I can do it without until we get to... No, no, not yet. Not yet. That's going to have audio with it, so you're going to want that one, okay? Uh, so make sure the computer's unmuted. You asked to see courage, and that's what I say. Look at our city's firefighters. Look at the police. The people who are rushing into burning stairways instead of rushing away from them. The ones who are running towards gunfire instead of those that are running away from it. You want to see courage? There's courage. You want to see valor? I say look at the National Guardsmen. Look at the National Guardsmen of our state that when a tornado rips through, or eight tornadoes rip through our county, like happened to us not too long ago, they are there to protect, to guard against those that would riot and disturb the peace. You want to see bravery and strength and sacrifice and resolve? I say, look at the American soldier. It's been said before, and God help us if we ever forget, it's these soldiers on our streets and overseas. It's these soldiers, not the reporter, who's given you the freedom of the press. It is these soldiers, not the preacher, who's given you the right to worship as you choose. It is these soldiers, not the politicians, who have given you the freedom to speak your mind. It is these soldiers, not the agitator, who has given you the right to protest. And it's these soldiers, the ones who salute the flag, who carry her into battle, who serve beneath her stripes, whose caskets and coffins are draped by her. It is these soldiers who give us the right to live and breathe free. But as we memorialize these individuals, as we remember them on a day like this, as we honor them, how do you really show them the honor that they deserve, the honor that they have earned? You know, I think Abraham Lincoln struggled with this. Very same question. 150 years ago as he stands at the bloody fields at Gettysburg and he looks over what became a mass grave for soldiers on either side of that conflict. I think he struggled with this. And there was an answer that he came to. I hope you can hear it. Can we try to play this audio? But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here, have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here, dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. That this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom. And that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. You know, I think those words are so appropriate on a day like this. 
A day that we wonder, how do you honor the sacrifice? How do you remember those who gave their lives on 9-11? Or whatever day in particular. How do you honor them? Lincoln answered that question. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. That we dedicate ourselves to ensuring that by remembering. You know, we are a forgetful people. You know that, and I know that. We repeat our mistakes. We turn to the wrong places for answers. We look to solutions in people and in programs rather than turning to God. We become comfortable. We become selfish. We become greedy and demanding and hateful and self-absorbed. It's the very nature of a human being. And it's all because we forget. Let me demonstrate that to you. Don't click ahead and give any cheats here. But I want you to tell me, when I say the name O'Hare, what is a famous O'Hare that comes to mind? Don't say the tortoise or you're out of this place. That is the, I said that someplace, somebody said the tortoise. That doesn't even make any sense for crying out loud. Famous O'Hare, somebody tell me. Madeline Murray O'Hare, that's the answer I always get. You can put her up there now if you want. Madeline Murray O'Hare, the famous atheist that started the group, the organization American Atheist, and they became dedicated to removing God from the public square. Uh, by the way, when people talk about how as Christians we shouldn't be confrontational, I sometimes wonder if they know who they follow. Uh, Jesus was the single most confrontational individual that I think ever walked the face of the earth. And how do I know that? Because we, he hasn't walked the earth in 2,000 years, and yet the mere mention of his name by a high school student at a public school graduation, people lose all control of their bodily functions. They start filing lawsuits. People from this group file lawsuits to remove that name. Jesus has been intimidating the snot out of people since he walked the earth, and it's going on today. He's a confrontational individual. Now, all of that said, Madeline Murray O'Hare, American atheists, dedicated to removing Jesus from the plague. We remember Madeline Murray O'Hare. But you know who we don't remember? Go ahead and put him up on the screen. World War II produced a lot of heroes, and one such man was Lieutenant Commander Butch O'Hare. He was a fighter pilot assigned to the aircraft carrier Lexington in the South Pacific. One day, his squadron is sent out on a mission. After he was airborne, he looked down at the fuel gauge and realized that somebody that was supposed to fill up his plane had forgotten to fill up his plane, and he was desperately low on fuel. He didn't have enough to be able to complete the mission and get back to the ship. So his flight leader told him, you can't continue with us, you have to go back to the carrier. So reluctantly, he drops out of formation, and he starts heading back towards the fleet to land. As he was returning to the mothership, he saw something that turned his blood cold. He saw a squadron of Japanese aircraft that were speeding their way towards that American fleet. Now the American fighters that he was a part of that would have been there to defend the fleet, they were out on a sortie. And he knew there was no way that he could get to that, that squadron and radio them to come back in time. So he had to make a decision. He couldn't warn the fleet of the approaching danger either. There was only one thing to do. He must somehow divert this Japanese squadron from the fleet. So laying all aside all thoughts of personal safety, this man right here dove into the formation of the Japanese planes. They didn't see him coming, he was above them. Dived straight into the squadron of Japanese planes. Wing mounted 50 calibers, blazing as he charged in. He attacked one plane after another surprised enemy plane, after another surprised enemy plane. He wove in and out of the now broken formation. He fired as, at as many planes as he possibly could until all of his ammunition was spent. Undaunted, he continued the assault even without ammunition. He dove at planes, trying desperately to clip their wings or their tails and damage as many of them as he possibly could, rendering them unable to fly. Finally, the exasperated Japanese squadron, tired of this little gnat that keeps flying in and out and damaging their planes, they take off in another direction. Deeply relieved, Butch O'Hare flies his tattered fighter, limping back to the carrier. And after he arrives, he reports in and relays the event. And obviously, they want to know what in the world happened to him. And he tells them that he inadvertently came across a Japanese squadron and he sustained some damage. That's all he reported. The only reason we know what happened is because he had gun-mounted cameras, as many of those planes did. And the film revealed the full tale and the extent of Butch's heroism in protecting that fleet. He had, in fact, destroyed over five enemy aircraft and rendered many of them incapable of flying any further. This takes place on February 20th, 1942. And for that action, Butch O'Hare became the Navy's first ever ace of World War II. 
He's also the first naval aviator ever to win the Congressional Medal of Honor. A year later, Butch is killed at age 29 in aerial combat. And his hometown was not about to let anyone forget the heroism of their boy, Butch O'Hare. And as a result, O'Hare International Airport in Chicago is named after Butch O'Hare. That heroism, and when I ask you the name O'Hare, you remember the atheist agitator. Do you see my point? I'm, I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm trying to make the, the point clear to you. We are a forgetful people. And God knows how easy it is for us to forget. He's always known. In Deuteronomy, what does he say to the children of Israel? He says, if you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and worship and bow to them, I testify before you today, you will surely be destroyed. If you forget where your strength comes from, you will be destroyed. He gives them the warning. And then when he establishes his power structure over Israel, what does he do? He, he, makes that, uh, he makes the high priest of Israel wear a special breastplate. It's made of linen cloth and it's got 12 jewels on it. Anybody know what the 12 jewels were for? The 12 tribes of Israel. So that he would not be forgotten what he has done for the 12 tribes of Israel. And then for us, for you and I, what does Jesus establish? Jesus establishes the Lord's Supper. Jesus himself said, do this in what? Remembrance of me. The early church came together every week for the breaking of bread and the drinking of the cup. And why? So that they didn't forget. And you say, these people lived with Jesus. They saw Jesus. They ate with Jesus. They were preached to by Jesus. How could they ever forget? God knows how forgetful of a people we really are. And that's why days like this... It's highly appropriate for churches to have these kinds of days so that we don't forget ourselves. Um, if you've got your Bibles, flip open to Hebrews chapter 12. If you're a heathen and you didn't bring it, don't worry about it. Okay, uh, I'll read that for you. But Hebrews chapter 12, I think, is so significant and so important. In verse 12, 1, it says, therefore, and you've got to stop right there. Stop right there. Ever, I've heard Bible teachers say this. Whenever you're reading scripture and you come across a therefore, you need to stop and realize what the therefore is there for. Okay? Uh, it's confusing, but you need to know what the therefore is there for. And what is the therefore there for? If you look back in chapter 11, this is the great faith chapter of Hebrews. Now, I'm not going to read all of, uh, of chapter 11. I'll just tell you. In chapter 11, you get some great names of the faith that we are to remember. Names like Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Joseph and Jacob and Moses and Rahab. And then in verses 32 and through 34 of, of chapter 11, I'm back in chapter 11 now, this is what he says. And what more shall I say? I don't have time to tell you about Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and the prophets who went through faith, uh, who through faith conquered kingdoms and ministered justice, gained what was promised who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Here is a great variety of people that was being mentioned here in chapter 11. Many of them, can I stress this to you, they are ordinary individuals. They are ordinary individuals that God uses in extraordinary ways to accomplish his will. Sort of like ordinary individuals on a crisp September morning. When they receive a call that a building is on fire. And so they do what is ordinarily in their service but is extraordinary to the rest of us. Lug 90 pounds of gear up 90 flights of steps to try to rescue those that are lost. And even when they knew that death was imminent, they stayed with those who were too injured to escape. God using ordinary individuals to do extraordinary things. Don't forget what is uh what does scripture go on and say therefore since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us you want to know how you honor those who have given their sacrifice who have given their all or who voluntarily agreed to do it on a daily basis how do you do it? You run the race that is marked out for you. You throw off everything that hinders. Why do we run the race with perseverance? Probably for more than one reason, but at least one of them is to honor the great cloud of witnesses. 
that has gone before? Why do we remember our heroes today? Why do we dedicate ourselves, as Lincoln said, to standing firm in the freedom wherewith Christ has made us free? That's Galatians 5.1. Why do we commit ourselves to the eternal purposes of the unending kingdom? Because it is one way that we honor them. The ones that have protected our right to be here in safety. The ones who have watered our soil, our soil with their blood. Men and women like this family friend. Take a look. Where there was about 30 boys that went into the service. My brother Bill, he, he wanted to go in so bad. He was in the Air Force along with my other two brothers. They were in the Air Force also. They were all three pilots. He uh, went over to the South Pacific. On the mission that he went on, he got shot down. On Christmas Eve, we got the message that Bill was killed. It's a beautiful thing to know, even though in the midst of sadness, and despair that your loved ones perished so that we might have the freedoms we have. I would like to express my thanks to all the people, all the, the, the men and women that have served our country and have perished so that we might have the freedoms that we have today. Scripture says, greater love hath no one than this, than a man lay down his life for his friend. To those heroes who have done so, and for those heroes who are willing to do so every day, thank you. Thank you for being our heroes. May God bless you and protect you always. And what comes of this, when we don't forget, when we honor their sacrifice, when we honor their loss or what they're willing to give, only then do we begin to comprehend the glory that God intends for a nation devoted to his purposes, as enshrined in the final verse of that national anthem that even to this day some will not stand for. The final verse of a national anthem that so often we don't even realize has other verses, but whose words are more powerful even than the first that we know. Oh, thus be it ever when free men shall stand between their loved homes and the war's desolation, blessed with victory and peace. May the heaven rescued land praise the power that hath made and preserved us a nation. Then conquer we must when our cause it is just. And may this be our motto in God is our trust. And the star-spangled banner in triumph shall wave over the land of the free and the home of the brave. Father, I thank you for this land. I thank you for a land that you have consecrated and set apart to serve a purpose in your eternal kingdom. Father, we don't mistake where our citizenship lies. It doesn't lie in any earthly made kingdom. It lies in heaven. But we also recognize the significance that earthly kingdoms can play in advancing the Great Commission. And we thank you so much for all that you have done and accomplished through this land that we love, the United States. And Father, as the song was sung this morning, we desire that you turn the tide. We know that the direction and the course and the path that we are on 
is reflective of a people that have forgotten. We have forgotten you. We have forgotten what you expect of us. Lord, so may that begin to change. And may we not expect that change in others who don't know you. May we be the change. May we start a reformation and a revolution. May it happen right here in this church in Wabash, Indiana. That we would become dedicated servants to fighting the eternal battles that matter most. And may we recognize that in doing so, the only way we find meaning is when we remember. We remember those who have gifted us with the abilities and the rights and the privileges to stand for truth. That is our prayer. We ask it in the name above all other names, the name of our risen and conquering Savior, Jesus Christ, your Son. And everyone said, amen. God bless you.